Uh, olá a todos. É, essa é a última palestra do dia. Ela vai ser em inglês com o professor Leslie Greengard. É, now in English, uh, I'm going to introduce Professor Greengard. Um, it's with great pleasure that we have him here. Uh, Dr. Greengard teaches at Curran Institute of Mathematical Science in NYU. He's also the director of the Flatiron Institute. Professor Greengard holds a bachelor in mathematics from Wesleyan University, a medical doctor degree from Yale School of Medicine, and a PhD in computer science from Yale. He's a member of both the US National Academy of uh, Engineering and a member of the U U.S. National Academy of Science. He won several awards such as the John, uh, John Von Neumann Prize. Professor, it's an honor to have you here. Well, th thank you very much. Um, so I guess with no further uh, ado, I will simply share my screen and get going. Okay, is, it, can it, is, there, is that good? Did everybody yeah, see that? Good. All right. So I, I have a lot of slides uh, and I speak very fast. I will try to uh, control myself. Um, but the, the subject of my talk is going to be a kind of an overview of uh, fast and adaptive methods to do very classical equations of mathematical physics, but in very complicated geometries. That's sort of the focus of <clears throat> almost everything I'm going to talk about. And just to give you some examples of what I mean by complex geometry, it, I mean the kinds of things that you see on the screen now. So it could be a problem that's, that's involving crystal growth, which is to say it, it's a, it involves the diffusion of temperature. It could be the diffusion of water in, in diffusion tensor imaging. It could be the diffusion of, 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 of uh, a chemical species in a, bio, in a biophysical setting, or it could be the calculation of fluid flow in a very complicated uh, microstructure. Okay, so these are all examples of equations that we understand very well, but we don't understand really qualitatively what those solutions do or quantitatively what they do in a complicated environment. Other examples of that that are not, so almost on the previous page, were, those were basically time dependent problems, but we also think about steady state problems. So on the left is a picture of a steady state heat calculation in a fuel cell. It's an example of a very complicated geometry I don't know if you can see the little holes, but in that fuel cell, there are something like 5,000 holes and it takes it about a half a million degrees of freedom just to describe the geometry. On, on just, just to discretize the surface, it barely resolved is a, is a very complicated thing because it's a very complicated physical object. Um, the middle panel is a, is a time harmonic calculation. That is to say, it's not, it's not steady state, but it's not, it's not really time dependent. It's, it's solving the Maxwell equations in the frequency domain. And the kind of calculation that you might want to do is to understand the transmission of light through a complicated microstructure. So the top panel is just a picture of many different dielectrics uh, components. And light is coming from the top, and we're interested in what the propagation is downward. And these are calculations that you can do uh, extremely rapidly with modern technology. And on the left is a calculation of um, a radar. And what you see is a, is a very multi-scale kind of discretization. So there's a, one second, I have to, I have to hide, hide everybody. I can see people's faces and I can't see my own slides. Okay, in any case, there's a, uh, there's a very small antenna behind the dish and that needs a much, much, much finer grid to resolve it than the rest of the dish. So the question is also, how do you build methods that are robust across multiple scales, um, even on the same object. Okay, so to do that, if, you, if you're gonna make all these calculations possible, then I, I, the first ingredient you need is that you have to have algorithms that are fast and robust, otherwise you can't deal with the scale. You're not gonna get uh, an accurate solution um, unless they're very high ordered discretizations. And the larger the object, the more important high order is because there's more and more of a chance for, for numerical errors to propagate in a large object than in a small object. So high order matters more for large, large objects. And from a user point of view, in order to be practical, you often want the algorithms to be precision dependent in a way that you can control and automatically adaptive in a way that you can't necessarily control. 
Okay. Um, again, just as advertising, once you build these codes, they should be easy to use, but it doesn't mean that they have to be easy to develop. And I think one of the, one of the themes of this talk is going to be that in order to develop this, the next generation of scientific computing tools, um, there's going to be an enormous amount of infrastructure in them. Just like building a very complicated car, it's not easy, but they're built of things that all work. And so assembling them into an even bigger, into an even bigger tool is a sensible thing to do. That's the way all engineering is done. It's historically not how applied mathematics is done. So we're trying to change that. Okay, so here's an example. And uh, I think this is my last kind of cartoon, but you can imagine this is, uh, this is the front end of an airplane. You're not seeing the rest of the airplane. But what you're supposed to see is that behind the pilot seat, there's a little blue box. Inside that little blue box, you see in the middle, there's a computer. And the question is, okay, what happens if, a, if an electromagnetic wave hits the airplane and you wanna know what effect it has on the motherboard sitting inside the computer box, sitting inside the cockpit of this airplane at high frequency, okay? That's either a doable calculation or, or not. And it turns out uh, that with sufficient technology in place, you can actually do calculations like this reliably. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about this more, but there's, there's a lot of very nice work that's been done by um, Eric Mickelson and his collaborators uh, at, at the University of Michigan and elsewhere. Okay, so this is a, here's the next cartoon that you often see in talks. And they talk about the following, that in the upper left, you have a physical system Okay, well, the physical system is something that that's the thing that you actually care about, but you model it by writing down some equations. Here, it's the Maxwell equations for electromagnetics. And you take those equations and you put them on a computer and then you do a simulation and then you do a prediction and then you refine this. And anybody who tells you this is not telling you the truth because in, in industrial practice, this is extremely rarely done. And it's not, re it's not done because the mathematical model is not a good description of the physical system. It's not done because the numerical simulation is often not a good enough approximation of the mathematical model. So the predictions that you make from the calculation don't allow you to close the loop in the way that you want. So either because of speed or because of accuracy or because of both. So, but this is really in some sense, the overall goal of why we like to model equations that we understand. It's so that we can influence the design of the physical object in the end. But every part, every arrow here has to be a sensible arrow for that to be a practical procedure. Okay, so let me just uh, point out a few things that my most of my colleagues don't like it when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So what are the approaches that, that we teach in, in scientific computing? Most of them were invented many years ago, in fact, before there were computers. So, you know, they find it difference methods, finite element methods, uh, all, all, of these cal all of these methods that we, that we build standard technology around, these are, these are great ideas, but they were not anticipating such large calculations to be done. Right? So they were designed, at a, they were conceived at a time when calculations were much smaller. And in fact, even, by, even in 1970, uh, it was considered a very reasonable statement to make that we don't compute to get numerical answers, we compute to get insight. That means they didn't really believe that the simulations were gonna be correct. And I, 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 I'm gonna to try to convince you that we're now in a different situation. That we have, that computers are, are good enough and algorithms are now good enough that in fact, not all problems, but an important class of problems can actually be solved correctly. And that to do that, we have to change the way that we think about numerical tools a little bit. We really have to think a little bit harder about the infrastructure around which we build our scientific computing software. So let me give a few examples of, if you ask a numerical analyst, what do we know how to do reliably? There's really two standard answers. The first one is we know how to do adaptive quadrature. So what does adaptive quadrature mean? It means I'm given an integrand, like what you see here in the function, namely, um, minus square root of x log x plus sine of 20x. So please integrate that from zero to one. Well, that's, that's easy to do. And there's a nice little demo that runs inside MATLAB, which I'll run now, called quad GUI, which simply shows you what happens as it goes through adaptive uh, quadrature. And I'm showing this cartoon because I'm showing you that without asking you any questions, 
it, it studies every subinterval and decides whether it's done the integral correctly. And if it has, it moves on to the next interval. And if it hasn't, it refines it. And it does that and, and essentially never makes a mistake. And what you see at the end is that there was a much finer grid near zero where root x log x is singular and many fewer points out towards one where, where nothing is singular. And I didn't tell it the singularity and it doesn't ask. It just self-consistently looks at the integrand and says, I need more points here and it puts more points there. So that is a completely reliable tool. So one thing we know how to do is adaptive quadrature in one dimension. Another thing that we more or less know how to do is solve, OD, solve ODEs that are not too complicated. And this is just, uh, again, a, a very quickly, a graph of a solution of uh, this Van der Poel equation, which is at the bottom, x double prime minus mu times one minus x squared x prime plus x with initial data at zero. You see the solution in the top plot, and you can see that the solution gets very singular uh, occasionally. And you can see that the code automatically uh, decreases the step size at that point, right? So what you, see, what you see in the bottom plot is the step size. You can see on the left, it, go, it takes, it's, it's taking steps on the order of 10 to the minus two, maybe 10 to the minus one, but it drops to 10 to the minus three or smaller every time it sees the solution changing rapidly. That's again done fully automatically. You, no one interferes with the code. It runs on its own and it more or less always makes the right decisions. Okay. So how does it do that? Um, I like to make this a, a analogy with, with pure mathematics sometimes. And of course, what I'm saying is not exactly true, but it's often true. And one point is that in pure mathematics, um, the, the way in which progress is made is I think of as building more and more machinery. It's mathematical machinery as theorems and lemmas and so on. But the purpose of that machinery, of that machinery is to build enough of it so that a new problem that you didn't know how to solve now becomes easy to solve. So most pure mathematical machinery has this, the, as its aim, taking something that which seemed intractable and saying, oh, yeah, that's, that's, it's obviously true. So you take your favorite mathematical theorem that's very hard from topology or analysis or algebra, and you'll see that the structure of the proof is, by the time you got to the end of the book, it, it was a half a page proof. The rest of the book was building up all the machinery that let you state that theorem in half a page. And I, I think that that's how applied mathematics should look too that the way you solve a complicated problem is there's enough machinery in place that you say, oh, I need one of these and two, two of those and three of these, and now I, now I understand how to solve the problem. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. And again, this is not typically the way codes are built now in scientific computing is you have an application and you build a code for that application. You don't build, you don't build infrastructure. Okay, and I, what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that many of the well understood PDEs are, are in, in a state where that infrastructure can't be built. Okay, and one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about that is that most of the problems I'm gonna describe are very well, not only are they well understood mathematically, they're very well posed. That is, they're well conditioned as a numerical matter and, the, and what I find surprising is that the standard methods that we use to approximate them discretize the partial differential equation directly. And when you do that, you get an ill-conditioned linear system. So the original physical problem is well-conditioned, but the, the problem that you end up solving numerically is ill-conditioned because you've discretized the PDE directly. That doesn't seem so wise. And the side effect of that is I think it's, it's prevented um, us from building more robust and more automatically adaptive tools. So let me give some examples of that. So, you know, the pro probably the most famous partial differential equation is the Poisson equation. So Laplacian of u equals f. And the standard numerical way of solving that is to replace the Laplacian with a finite difference approximation. So on the upper right, you see that what's called the discrete Laplacian, which is a central difference a formula to approximate each second derivative. And then instead of solving the Poisson problem, you solve the discrete Poisson equation. That is, the discretized Laplacian against a vector is the right-hand side discretized on the grid. Okay, suppose just as a, as a really simple example, 
imagine you wanted to solve the Laplacian of u equals f, but in free space. So there's no boundary condition here except you know, so, some, some condition at infinity. But you're, if you're gonna solve this with the differential equation, you have to put it in a box. Now you need a boundary condition on the box. You need to decide what to do at these coarse fine interfaces between grids. You need a solver, you need error estimates. You need a lot of, you need a lot of things. And um, it's ignored, that solution process ignored in at least one century of mathematics, which is to say the 19th century. In some sense, a huge part of the 19th century was devoted to not solving the Poisson equation that way, but trying to understand analytic aspects of that problem that could be exploited in a representation. They weren't thinking about computers. But I've, so, so let's, let's look at the one dimensional problem. If I told you that the second derivative of u equals f, would you tell me that the solution to that is to write down a discrete stencil for the second derivative and solve a discrete linear system? I, not if you took calculus. I think most people who didn't take a numerical analysis course would think, well, the answer to u x x equals f is the double integral of f. What are you talking about with these stencils? There's nothing to solve, right? Wait, wait, on the right, the formula on the right is not a, dis a discretization of the differential equation. It's the solution operator. So what I'm gonna to try to convince you of is that that's not limited to calculus and u double prime equals f. If you told me, I now back to higher dimensions, if you wanna solve the Laplacian of u equals f, that also has an analytic solution. I don't need to, to, to discretize u and solve the differential equation. I can write down the solution operator. And the solution operator for the Poisson equation in free space is what, what's called the convolution of the data, which is f, with the fundamental solution for the Poisson equation. So for those of you who don't know it, I'll tell you what that is. In two dimensions, the fundamental solution of the Poisson equation is log. It's log of distance or log of one over distance. And in three dimensions, it's one over R, the very famous gravitational potential of a point source, right? So if you have a smooth uh, function F in space, all you have to do is to evaluate the solution operator, there's nothing to solve. All you're doing is, is computing that solution directly. I don't need to put a boundary condition on the box. The error estimate is trivial. It depends entirely on did I resolve f and how well did I compute the integral? And historically, no one solved the Poisson equation this way. So then, then you have to ask why, since I thought that's what they told you in books written in 1920. And the answer is, well, it's too expensive. And it's too expensive because every the solution at every point x depends on, oh, the, 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 there's a mistake in my formula. It should have been the integral of g of x minus x prime, f of x prime, dx prime. Sorry. So it, it depends, the solution at x depends on every point x prime. So it's dense. And, and, and if you have an n by n grid with, so there's n squared grid points, the naive calculation of the solution by writing down the solution operator takes n to the fourth operations and that's too expensive. On top, of, on top of the expense, you also have to integrate these annoying functions, which are weakly singular. And so you need good quadrature rules. But if you can solve those two problems, then you're done. So I'm not gonna to say too much about the fast algorithms for, for the Poisson equation because they're ancient. And uh, I'm gonna, I wanna tell you things that are a little bit newer, but I will just say that we now, we, we have it embedded in software now the ability to do all such problems in either O of n or O of n log time, not just for the Green's function for the Poisson equation, but for all the Green's functions that you see here and many others. So the Green's function, the first one that you see there is the Green's function for heat flow, right, which is a Gaussian. Um, the Green's function one over R we just saw. If you're doing wave propagation, the Green's function is e to the i k times distance divided by distance and elastic waves and are, are, are more unpleasant looking, but these are all well-known Green's functions from classical mathematics, okay? And the point is that, that there are now fast algorithms for all those cases. I'll say a little bit about how those fast algorithms work, but not too much. So all of these things fall into the, into the in mathematically into what's called potential theory. 
potential theory essentially meaning don't solve the differential equation itself, try to rewrite the differential equations in terms of integrals and Green's functions. And so that, so the first thing you do is to say, I'm not gonna solve the differential equation. I, I'm gonna write it in an integral form. Oddly enough, sometimes there are, you have that requires doing new mathematics and finding new integral representations. It often requires designing new quadrature rules. And as I just said, in order, to, in order to be practical, all of these things have to sit on top of appropriate fast algorithms. The advantage of doing them, however, is exactly like I showed in the adaptive quadrature example, that once you have these codes in place, automatic adaptivity becomes trivial because it's exactly the same as what you do when you do adaptive quadrature. Um, I won't talk about misconceptions because until, until someone asks a question. But the question people often ask is, well, you can only do this for a very limited class of differential equations. And the answer to that is no, we can do it for any differential equation. But I'll only discuss that at the very end, if people ask. Okay, let me go, what I'm gonna go through now, let me just look at the time. What I'm gonna go through now is a, is a, is, is a one-dimensional problem, just because we can un understand this in much greater detail in, in, a, in a short time. So this is a linear second order differential equation. There's a little epsilon there to suggest that it might be hard. So it's a singular perturbation problem. If epsilon is zero, it's a little more, it's, a, it's not solvable. So this is a second order pro equation. There's a variable coefficient P, there's a variable Q, there's some linear boundary condition. And this is a rich enough class of problems that all sorts of things can happen. You can have very oscillatory parts of the solution. You can have boundary layers. You can have internal layers. You can have things that look like cusp singularities in the interior somewhere. Um, I'm going to write them. Uh, we're going to. I'm just going to. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that it's in the simpler form that's written below. So it's u double prime plus p tilde u prime plus q tilde u equals f tilde with just a linear boundary condition. So I'm just. I'm just ignoring the most general linear boundary condition and assuming Dirac play data. Okay, homogeneous directly data. And the reason for that is I, can, I know how to write down a representation of the solution involving a Green's function. So I don't know the Green's function for this differential equation because it's variable coefficient, that would be some work. But I do know the Green's function for u double prime equals f. There's the one dimensional Poisson equation. And that Green's function is, uh, is in this little box on the side. Okay, so I'm gonna write down u in this form where sigma is not known. So I'm, I picked this as an integral representation, and now we're gonna plug it into the, into, the, into, this, into the differential equation on top. And when you do that, you get the following equation. And instead of solving the differential equation, we now wanna solve this integral equation for the unknown sigma. And in mathematics, that's called a Fredholm equation of the second kind, because there's a term that's a, that has an identity operator here in front of the sigma, that first term. So this is identity plus, for those of you who've done some functional analysis, this is identity plus a compact operator acting on sigma equals the right-hand side. So the way we're gonna solve it is we're gonna discretize sigma using a piecewise high order polynomial. We're gonna compute all the integrals exactly. That gives us high order accuracy. And it turns out we can solve this linear system which is dense and n by n in O of n time. If you did it, if you if you if you've all taken numerical linear algebra, then you all know that if you solve a dense n by n linear system, that inverting it takes n cubed operations. But it turns out for this very special linear system, you can solve it in O of n operations, and it's based on the following fact that if I wrote down that linear system as a matrix, all the blocks that you see that have a one in them are rank one objects, because they're dense but they're trivial. So, so a rank one object means it's an outer product, that it's of the form U V transpose, where U and V are vectors, okay? And every single off diagonal block is special and has that property. So now I won't make you do the, give you this as a homework assignment, but if I told you, can you design a solver that solves this in less than N cubed operations, you would design such a solver, okay? If you, if you wanted to get an A in the class, you would have to design such a solver. Okay, and I'll give, you a, I'll give you a little bit of a hint about how such a solver works. So um, let's, here's a much simpler example, right? Let's look at, 
Um, let's look at this two by two linear system at the top. So imagine that I, I have, I, I break my unknowns, which I've ordered from left to right as X1 and X2. So I'm writing it as A11, that's the, that's the, the one one block and the two two block and these rank one things on the off diagonal, right? So I'm gonna introduce two new coefficients. I'm gonna define alpha to be um, V1 transpose X2 and beta to be V2 transpose X1. And if I do that and, and, and plug in the alpha and do a little algebra, you, you get this, what's in blue here. Is I can rewrite the original system. I multiply the top equations by A11 inverse and the bottom equations by A22 inverse. And I get this two by two linear system. Okay. So this two by two linear system has an identity on the diagonal and, sorry, has, I, I, I lied. The, this is now a two by two linear system for beta and alpha. I, if I take the first equation and multiply by V2 transpose, and take the second equation and multiply by V1 transpose, then this was a, if the original linear system was N by N, this equation, the middle blue, the, the first blue equation is N over two by N over two. The next one is N over two by N over two. But alpha and beta are just scalars. And so once I multiply the first one by V1 transpose, by V2 transpose, and the second by V1 transpose, I get not, this is now a two by two scalar linear system. So these are just numbers, right? This is just a quadratic form. V2 transpose A11 inverse U1 and V1 transpose A22 inverse U2. So we know how to solve uh, a two by two linear system. And when you solve that, you get a formula for alpha and beta, okay? And once I know what alpha and beta is, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, someone asked, uh, what's the benefit of solving an inter integral equation instead of a differential equation in this case? So, um, right, so th there, are, there are many. Uh, the main one will be that we never lose any digits. So um, th it's a much better condition formulation. And the second one is it's much more reliable to build automatic adaptivity on top of the integral equation code than on top of, than on top of the differential equation code. And we've done that experiment side by side. I, I, I'll show you the, the adaptive thing in a minute, but when we get to the next slide, you'll see, um, you'll see an incredible fact about the integral equation code. And then you have to believe me that it wouldn't work if I did it to the differential equation. But I, 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 didn't, I didn't show you those plots. So we'll, we'll see that in a minute, okay? All right, so this is, not a, this is not a fast solver, but if you did a little operation count, you'd see that just by this trick I, I just showed you, instead of doing n cubed work, you would end up doing n cubed divided by four work. That's not so great, but I only did this once. If you do this hierarchically and you do it all the way down and keep doing this recursively, you, you will get to an order n solver eventually. So it's, it's, it, it doesn't say n cubed divided by a constant, a recursive version of Sherman Morrison gives you a linear time solver in one dimension. Okay, so now the so now now I'm going to try to explain why the integral equation approach has gives you benefits. And remember what I wrote. What's the equation that we're writing down here is the full equation that we have to solve. And what we're going to do is instead of solving it on the entire interval, is solve it on a and then solve it on b separately. And then we check to see whether the solution that we computed. Sigma A, that is the, the solution on the left panel, or sigma B, the solution on the right panel, is resolved. And if it's resolved, we don't subdivide anymore. And if, and if it isn't resolved, we divide it in two and repeat the problem. So that's exactly what you do when you're computing an integral by adaptive quadrature. So that, that doesn't change. So we might have decided that the left interval needs to be subdivided, so we do it again. And we do that until the problem has been resolved. And uh, I won't say much about the theorem, but we, we proved many years ago that this integral equation has a error estimate that you can write down that you cannot write down for the differential equation. And that's, so mathematically, this is the advantage. And the advantage is that the error that you made in sigma can be shown to be bounded by the condition number of the, of the integral equation times P minus P bar here is really an estimate of how well you approximated the integral. So that's a quadrature error. And F bar minus F is how well did I represent the right-hand side? And, and that's a resolution of the function error. 
So if you resolve the right-hand side and you did the intervals correctly, you're guaranteed to get the right answer with a bound that has to do with the condition number of the integral equation. And you say, so what? Answer is, if I did this to the differential equation, the condition number is infinity, and it's not a very interesting estimate, right? Because a differential operator is an unbounded operator. And the definition of a condition number is the norm of the operator times the norm of the inverse. So both of those have to be finite numbers for the problem to have a finite condition number. The integral equation has the property, a Fredholm equation, a second kind integral equation, has the property that not only is the norm, is, does that operator have a finite norm, but its inverse has a finite norm. And in the differential equation, its inverse has a finite norm because it's the solution operator, but the differential equation itself has an unbounded condition number. And therefore it's a trivial estimate. It says the error is less than infinity. So you only get this estimate in the integral form. And, our, and the way that we do error estimation has to do with the resolution of sigma. And what I'm showing you now is how the, a code that's built on that solver automatically picks where the refinement should be and never makes a mistake, amazingly enough. And it never makes a mistake long before the problem has been resolved. So this is a three-dimensional plot, which is very fancy. What you see in the back is the solution. What you see on the floor is the grid. So, and so as, you, as you go through refinements, it's showing you the grid that's built through successive refinements. And on the left, you see the error. You can see the error is 10 to the zero for many, many, many refinement steps. And even in the situation where it has no idea, it had, there are no correct digits in the solution, it's still putting the refinements in where the solution is oscillatory and not where it's not oscillatory. Okay, so this, this, is, this does that for every differential equation that we've tried. So here's a, this problem, epsilon u double prime minus x u. Um, for those of you who studied ODE theory, you know that when x is negative, this will be an oscillatory problem, and when x is positive, it's a decaying problem. So you, you, we know qualitatively that the solution is very oscillatory for x less than zero and not oscillatory for x greater than zero. That's just a fact about differential equations. But we don't use that fact. We don't cheat. We don't, we don't use it, oh, I know it's going to oscillate there, so we were fine there. This is done by self-consistently looking at whether the solution of the integral equation is resolved. At each, at each step. And the error is one for many, many, many uh, steps of refinement until the end. And again, we can go, go through many such examples. Whoops. And this is not limited to, um, to one dimension. It, we, we've done this for problems of, of elasticity in two dimensions, where the question is, how many points do I need on all these, on these little ellipses, even though they're very close to touching? And the solution is very nearly singular every time those things come near to touching. And what we, can, what we do is we start with a crude solution and then we, around every ellipse, which is divided up into panels, we ask, do, do we think that density is resolved on that panel? And if it's, if it's resolved, we leave it alone. If it's not resolved, we refine it. And what happens is when you do that, that you see, um, it automatically ends up refining exactly where the solution is more singular, which is usually where two of those inclusions are near close to touching. Okay. Uh, what do we do now? <clears throat> All right, let me get it. I need, I need a drink. Okay. So I'm, I'm now gonna move from the kind of elliptic world to the time dependent world. Um, so I'm hoping that you've all seen the heat equation in one dimension. That's ut equals uxx plus f. I'm writing it down with, with periodic boundary conditions on 0, 2 pi with zero initial data. That's a, that should be a simple problem. And I ask, what is the standard PDE way of solving that problem? So you take a PDE class and they tell you the way to do that is you write down u as a Fourier series. So we're going to write it as a sum of alpha k of t e to the i k x. That's automatically imposed periodicity. Um, at time zero, we want it to be zero. So that tells us what alpha of zero is. We have to, we're gonna take F, which is the data. We're gonna approximate it as a Fourier series at every time step. Okay, that's that middle equation in blue, right? So F is the, F is gonna be expand, is gonna be turned into a Fourier series of, with Fk, the coefficient at time t. 
And then we're going to plug the representation for you back into the differential equation, and you get an ordinary differential equation for alpha k of t. Is that okay for everybody? All right. So, so, and the differential equation is alpha k prime is minus k squared alpha k plus fk with zero, with alpha of zero equals zero, so that u of x zero is zero. Okay. Great. So what we have to do, there's only a few things to do and this becomes a numerical method. You truncate the Fourier series because you can't sum up infinitely many terms. That's no problem. We have to evaluate FK accurately. That's not so hard. And then we have to solve the ODE. So I'm going I'm to, let me go through two possible ways of solving the ODE. The first one is to use Euler's method. The first method everybody learns. So that says that alpha K at time T plus delta T is the old alpha K plus delta t times the right-hand side at time t. The other option is to write down the correct answer, right? So this is, this is not the, the second line, which is the Duhamel approach. There's no approximation here. That is the analytic solution of the ODE. And it looks like a very stupid thing to do. And why is it stupid? It's because alpha k of t depends on the entire history from zero to t. So that doesn't look like a very reasonable way to solve anything. I can't keep going back to time zero a million years in the future, right? But if you look at the, what's in blue, it says you were wrong to think that, this, that you have to go back to time zero. It satisfies a very simple recurrence. That is alpha k at time t plus delta t is simply a damping by the factor e to the minus k squared delta t, the old value, and only adding an increment on the last time step. So it looks like it's dependent on the whole history, but it's trivially not dependent on the whole history. So this is now as fast, what's in blue is as fast as doing Euler's method. And if you use Euler's method, you have a very well-known problem, which is if you took a large time step, it blows up. And it blows up exactly when this factor of one minus k squared delta t is bigger than one. And that tells you that delta t basically has to be on the order of one over k squared, the, the maximum frequency that you have in the problem squared. And that means that delta t has to be of the uh, proportional to your spatial mesh, delta x squared. So if any time, that's, that, Euler's method is, is in the world of ODEs called an explicit method. And that's typically what you see with explicit methods. That there's, a, there's a stability condition that says the time step can't exceed a certain value or the solution will be unstable, and that's true, but it's not true of Duhamel. If we use Duhamel, and I took a large time step, it gets better, right? The longer I go, the, the more damping you get from e to the minus k squared delta t. So it has exactly the opposite behavior, and this is the behavior of the physics. If you said, I'm doing a diffusion problem, and I waited forever, the answer is it should be even smoother so why do people build numerical methods based on things that blow up is, is a good question to ask yourself because it does not correspond to the physics. The physics says in a large time step, things should be more diffusive and the Duhamel principle is consistent with that behavior of the, of the exact solution. So it should be the way you do everything. So then you should ask what's in red, which is why doesn't everybody do this all the time? What is all this business about instability and so on. And the answer is, well, I gave you a trivial problem, right? I told you we're gonna solve the heat equation in one dimension on a periodic box. And if you ask yourself, this is a slightly abstract thing to ask yourself, but if you ask yourself, why was I able to do that? It's because Fourier, the, those Fourier modes, e to the i, k, x, happen to be the eigenmodes of the Laplacian on that box with periodic boundary conditions. So we didn't just pick any old basis. We got really, really lucky. We we're trying to solve ut equals the Laplacian of u, and we were given the eigenmodes of the problem. So it's certainly true that anybody who's, anybody who's given a periodic problem to solve, they will use the Fourier modes. If they're given the periodic problems on a box in, in three dimensions, they'll still use the Fourier modes. The problem is, if I give you a general geometry, I have no idea what that basis is. So this is not a method that's usable in the general case. And a second problem is that Fourier methods are inherently non-adaptive. I won't, I won't, I, that's a theorem. I won't prove it now, but you, you, there is no such thing as an adaptive Fourier method. 
But the main point is that the whole class of methods doesn't work in complicated geometry because you don't have the basis in which you can simply write down the solution operator. Okay, so now we're, I'm gonna say things that may be a little bit harder to follow, but I apologize, we won't go forever. Um, so now suppose that we wanna solve this heat equation, ut equals little plus and u plus f in some, in some horrible space-time domain. So I, I'm interested in the question of how do I solve the heat equation in a domain that's complicated and moving in time. So the mathematician's notation for that is we think of omega capital T as the space-time domain and gamma capital T as the space-time boundary. And mathematically that you write that as a product of the boundaries at all the individual time. So gamma of little t is the domain at time little t and partial gamma of little t is the boundary at time little t. Okay? So we, we want to solve the heat equation. This is just like the one dimensional case. There's, there's, a, there's a forcing term F, there's initial data, which we'll call U zero, and then there's data on the boundary, which we'll call G, okay? So again, if you were gonna do this with a finite difference or finite element scheme, you would discretize the domain. If it's an exterior problem, then you have to put it in an artificial boundary and decide what to do there. If you use an explicit marching scheme, you have stability problems. And if you use an implicit marching scheme, then you have to solve it in an elliptic differential equation at every time step. That's the trade-off. Right? Explicit schemes are explicit, means you just write down the propagator, but you can't take a large time step. Or you take a large time step, but then you actually have to solve a large system, which is the I don't know how to say it. It's the elliptic, it's an elliptic differential equation, it turns out. Okay, and the last point, which is very technical, I'm not gonna talk about, is that when the boundaries are moving, it's very hard to get high order accuracy in the representation using uh, simple PDE discriminations. So potential theory for the heat equation says, we're gonna do this in a completely different way. We know the Green's function, okay? The Green's in free space, the Green's function for free space is simply e to the minus distance squared divided by four t, scaled by four pi t to the minus the dimension over two. What does that mean? For, for those of you who don't think about Green's functions all the time, like me, you can think of it as I took a delta function of heat and released it at a point, that's the temperature profile anywhere in space at time t. Okay, that's, that's what the Green's function is for the heat equation. So I wanna solve this equation and classic, what's called, cla well, what I, potential theory for the heat equation says, we're gonna write down the solution. We're not gonna solve the PDE. And the solution is, I can take care of the initial data, u of x zero equals u naught with an initial potential, that's the term in blue. I can take care of the inhomogeneous term f with a space-time integral against the Green's function. So it's, it's it, the, the, in green is the double integral in space and time of the Green's function times f. f is known, there's not an unknown there. u zero is known, f is known, and g is known but I don't know how to satisfy the boundary condition trivially. So what I'm gonna do is to give myself an unknown density mu, which lives only on the space-time boundary. So it doesn't live in the interior, it only lives on the boundary. And I'm gonna write down an equation for that using what's called a double layer potential. So again, if, if this is not familiar, it'll be too fast, but it'll be short and painless. So a double layer means an integral over the space-time boundary of the normal derivative of the Green's function against that density. And it's, it's, so the, it, this operator is a very smooth operator for x off the boundary, and it has some jumps when you, when you get close to the boundary. So if I look at that function d of mu, it's different from the inside and from the outside. And d star is gonna be my notation for the average of the limit from the two sides. So I take the limit from the inside of D, I take the limit from the outside of D, and I'm gonna call that function D star. And it's, 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 it's a well-known fact to those who know it, that when you take that limit from the inside, you get minus one half mu plus D star. And when you take the limit from the outside, you get plus one half mu plus D star. That's enough to say, okay, how am I gonna represent the solution to the heat equation? I'm gonna write it as an initial potential, that's the blue, the vo a volume potential, again, no unknowns here. It's, it's the Green's function convolved with the initial data u zero, the space-time convolution with the forcing term f, 
And then I'm gonna add in, in this light blue color, uh, the double layer with an unknown mu. And when I plug that in to the boundary condition, you get this integral equation, which is in gray, which is one of my favorite equations. It's an equation that says minus one half mu plus D star is equal to a known right-hand side. So that right-hand side involves all of the data that were in the problem. G, which is the boundary data you want, the G, G, this capital G acting on U zero, the initial potential, which you know, and V of F, which you know. The nice thing about this equation in gray is that as a linear system, it looks like minus one half the identity plus a lower triangular matrix. Okay, that this in, in the language of integral equations is called a Volterra integral equation of the second kind. You have to be a genius to fail to solve that problem because anybody should know how to solve a lower triangular linear system if they took linear algebra. Nothing can go wrong, especially if there's, an, if there's a one along the diagonal, right? So there's no possibility of instability. There's no possibility of anything going wrong. And there's no possibility of getting the answer wrong unless, as I said, you're a genius. You, then you can get it wrong. So if you can put into this form, the problem is finished. And again, the question is, why don't people solve the heat equation this way on moving geometries? And the answer is, it's way too expensive without fast algorithms, way too expensive. The advantages are, it, it, it handles all the things that I was complaining about in the differential world. As it, we, we can do, you can do exterior problems this way, you can do interior problems this way. If there's no forcing term, you're only discretizing the boundary. You never have to put a mesh into the domain. These methods are unconditionally stable and they're, they're explicit. That is, I, I, all you have to do is to back solve that lower triangular matrix. We can achieve arbitrary order of accuracy on moving geometry. And as I said, the, the caveat, this asterisk is nobody uses them in practice because they're way too expensive. And the reason, and, and they're way too expensive because, well, uh, well, we'll see in the next slide, because all these terms are fully history dependent. So they're not only dependent on all of the other points at all times, they're dependent on all previous points at all times. So there's a huge analytic benefit and most of the things that we understand analytically about this equation came from this way of thinking. But numerically, that has, that's usually been ignored because it looks like a terrible idea. So, but after 30 years, okay, it's, it's 2020, I think, as a year. So we, we, we've been doing this since 1990. Um, we've built a lot of machinery that allows us to deal with such operators in linear time. And there's been many people who have involved in this work and I couldn't, I, I couldn't put down a complete list. Um, whoops. Okay, but I, I, and I will, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm gonna have to uh, finish up quickly. Um, I'm gonna give you just a hint of how one fast algorithm works here, which is how do we convolve a function u zero with the heat kernel e to the minus distance squared over 14, right? If I, that would, that would normally be a dense matrix, so it would be expensive to do. There's an algorithm that's called the fast Gauss transform, um, which solves that problem as follows. So and we're, we're trying to do this calculation that's in the upper left, right? Summing up Gaussians with, with various weights. The key analytical trick is that I, is the, uh, what's in the upper right. That is that Gaussian can be decomposed into a sum of functions that depend on X and functions that depend on the XI. Okay, so that's, that, that I just took a general kernel on the left and made it a separable kernel on the right. It's, it's, it's now a product of functions that depend on the X variable and on the X I variable. And these, these little functions H are just, are the Hermite functions, which, is, which are essentially nothing but partial derivatives of the Gaussian itself. And the Psi are just uh, Taylor coefficients. So this is, this is really just Taylor's theorem applied to a Gaussian. And the reason this is useful numerically is that if I take the whole box and I superimpose on it little boxes of size root capital T, that a little bit of thinking will convince you that I don't have to go very many boxes in root t before the u is exponentially small. As if I have a source in, the, in, the, in that dark box that it has no influence beyond a few neighbors. So all I need to do is to compute the, the force, compute the effect of sources in that little black box on a finite region, which is the gray boxes. 
and ignore everybody else. And the way you can do that fast is by superposition and using this separable expansion of the Gaussian. So what we do is instead of computing the sum of the Gaussians, we expand it as what's called an, uh, an Hermite series, that is a sum over Hermite coefficients, H, N1, N2, where N1 and N2 are truncated at P terms for all the sources in that little black box and evaluate that Hermite expansion at all the targets in the gray region. And I won't go through the whole operation account, uh, which is messy, or the error analysis, but this point number one is that these expansions converge extremely rapidly. So P, when P is 10, you have basically machine precision. And uh, the operation count, if you go through it, ends up being that the cost takes O of N work times P squared. Where, and since P is precision dependent and not dependent on the number of sources, this is a linear time scheme. Okay, so I know that was very fast, but the, the, the point, the, the, the key idea is that I have sources, I think of this in terms of sources and targets, and I compute interactions between sources and targets through representations on these boxes and, try, and understanding the region of influence of every box. And if you do that carefully enough, you'll discover that you can beat the complexity bound that makes you think it takes n squared work and you can get, you can get all the way down to linear time work. Okay, uh, so Professor, we have another question about this. Okay. What is the connection between fast Gauss and fast Fourier? I'm sorry, and, and fast Fourier? Yes. Um, okay, so the, the quick answer to that is there's very little direct connection that the fast Fourier transform is designed for an actually a matrix that's very different in structure. It's very oscillatory. And it's fast because of algebraic ideas. The FFT algorithm is not an approximate algorithm. It's not an approximate algorithm. It, is, it, is, it does exactly what the discrete Fourier transform does, but it does it in n log n operations instead of n squared. If you told me that you want infinite precision, like the F, in infinite precision, the FFT gives you infinite precision. This algorithm is only fast because I've used approximation theory. If you told me you want seven digits, it's a linear time method. If you told me you want 14 digits, it's still a linear time method, but with a worse, worse constant. If you told me that you want infinitely many digits, I don't have an algorithm for you. You would have to go back and do the n squared method. So the fast Gauss transform and the fast multiple method and all the algorithms that we work on, we call them analysis-based fast algorithms because they rely on approximations and control of precision as an essential ingredient. And the FFT does not have that in it. So the FFT is much more powerful in that, in that sense. That is, in infinite precision, it gives you an infinite precision answer. We actually use precision to our advantage. That's the big difference. Okay. Mm, professor, we have another question. Uh, okay. The ON algorithm for quickly resolving the PDE depends on very regular structure of the differential operator as translated to linear algebra. Does this hold for Einstein's equation? Well, we're, we're, talk, we're talking about general, general relativity. Is, did you say Einstein's equation? Yeah, Einstein's equation. Um, uh, we're working on it. Is, is the answer to that. that that's, a, that's a hard question. Um, Nonlinear hyperbolic wave equations have not, we have not made a lot of progress with integral equations so far in that world. We have made some progress on linear wave equations, um, it, it, linear hyperbolic equations, like the time-dependent Maxwell equations or the time-dependent scalar wave equation or the, or the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. But we have not, done so well at this, to, at this point on the nonlinear side. Um, but for elliptic problems, we can do nonlinear problems all still quite easily because we linearize the way the PDE people would and we only use our technology on the linearized problem. So Newton, Newton saved us there. But doing Newton to, to the nonlinear hyperbolic problem is a little more complicated. Okay. Um, where was I? I'm almost done, actually. Uh, right. So there we were. So I'm, I'm not, I, again, th 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 there's a huge amount of, of stuff I'm hiding because it's very technical and very 
unpleasant for those who don't like to do it. So I won't tell you in detail how we do this, but we have variants of the gas transform that work for volume distributions, for, for boundary distributions, either involving the Green's function or its normal derivative. Um, the, my, my, I mean, I, I've done, I, I, sometimes I give a talk on this topic and I say, this is an example of failure. This is, this is a good lesson because I've been doing this for 30 years. I was convinced in each five-year interval that I knew what the right way to do it. And then I abandoned it and tried again. And I'm on my fifth attempt now. And I think I like this one, but in 10 years, I might not like it anymore. But the one I like now is the level restricted hierarchical of fast gas transform, which my student Jun Wang and I um, published in 2017 which is different from the one from 30 years ago and cleaner. Um, and okay, one of the reasons that we like this way of doing business is, is again, what I was emphasizing before, that if you have a right, if you have a function F that's been well approximated on here, we now have a version of the gas transform that takes that as input and simply returns the answer. There's no discussion of, of uh, of error estimation or order of accuracy or, or anything, there's only two questions. How well did you approximate F? And we have control of that. And then how many digits did you carry out the fast gas transform to? And we have control of that. So let me not bore you with timings. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say that in, in the, our current versions of the fully adaptive gas transforms are about 10 times slower than an FFT right now, which is not bad because FFTs are very annoying if you're competing, they're very fast. So we're getting to approximately, you know, on the order of a million points per second per core. FFTs run at about 10 million points per second per core when they're really optimized. But the fact, but the point is that the gas transforms are now operating at speeds that are up, sort of in the same ballpark as the FFTs. Uh, let me not discuss that. I would just say that without discuss, discussing details about how we do the history dependence, the, the reason these things are so expensive, again, is that you're going from time zero to the current time T around the whole boundary, every density point at every previous time at every boundary point affects you. And if you did that naively, it would take you years to do a problem with a thousand points in a thousand time steps. Because it's, it's N squared, N squared, where N is the number of time steps and M is the number of points. So you have to get rid of that. And there's a lot of technology around that most of that's well reviewed if you want to look at this. We have a recent archive paper that's more or less a review paper um, that, that goes through a lot of that detail. So you, I'll, I'll leave that up there for a second. Um, it's, it's Jun Wang, me, um, Shi Dong Zhang, and Shravan Vira Paneni. It was, came out last year on, on archive. Um, but the, the, the key analytic insight for people who've done analysis on, on these problems is to introduce a parameter delta that that divides the world into the local part in time and the history part in time and to treat them by different methods. So we have, we have methods that deal with the history part using the fast gas transform. And we have methods that deal with local part that also rely on, an, on a new variant of the, uh, on, a, on a slightly different variant of the gas transform plus some asymptotics. So that's all a big mess, but let me show you what happens when you built all that machinery. That is you can now solve problems like the heat equation with a source term that's moving and the code automatically tracks the structure of the solution and the structure of the right-hand side with no user interference and with no mistakes. So this, and, and it does this at very little cost. So if you, most methods that are highly adaptive become much more expensive as a price that you pay for the adaptivity. So you win on memory, but it becomes more expensive to carry out. These codes, the fully adaptive versions of our solvers run at approximately the same number of degrees of freedom per second as a uniform grid. That's, an, again, because of the same idea that it's no different from adaptive quadrature. All of the fast algorithms are kind of, are, are local in, in the way that they interact with neighbors and done hierarchically to deal with stuff at a distance. So there's, there's very little penalty to pay for uh, being able to deal with, with complicated geometry Here's a problem, again, where we're solving a boundary value. This is a moving geometry problem where we've assigned different Dirichlet data to these different uh, objects. And so this is not the right-hand side. This is now a very non-singular solution in the ambient space. 
but the code correctly tracks fine grids. And as the boundaries move, it keeps the fine grids moving with the boundary. And all of this stuff is done fully automatically. And to give you a sense of the timing, so even with a very comp, you, can, you can't even, it's not even a well-resolved picture, but a problem which has, you know, 100,000 points on the boundary, which is hard to do graphically, and a million grid points runs at about, at the moment, at about 10, 10 seconds per time step. So it's, we're, um, we're hoping to keep, we like to keep squeezing on those constants, but the fact is that we can do things now in very complicated geometry with very high throughput. Um, at the moment, much higher throughput, if they're not moving than if they are moving, we'd lose a factor of 10 here and there, which I'm annoyed by, but uh, this whole class of problems is now fairly tractable. Um, <clears throat> so let, let, me, let me close, I only have one more slide. Um, what was I gonna say? Right, so that for, for this last part of my talk, which was about diffusion problems and, and moving geometries, we, there's a lot of technology that, I, I, that has been built into these codes that I wasn't able to describe. So I, I said almost nothing about how we handle that local part as a, in terms of accuracy and quadrature. Um, but I gave you kind of a sketch of how the uh, FGT works, the fast gas transform. And if you understand the kind of flavor of that algorithm, it's, it's relatively easy to see how to do that adaptively. Um, it has the advantage, as I said earlier, that because of the nature of the integral representation, if you approximate all of those functions to high order in time, you get high order accuracy. And that's not true if I was, if I was solving the differential equation because across boundaries, it's a non-smooth function in, in the ambient space. And so if you, if, you don't treat the layer, if you don't treat the moving geometry as a geometric object, it's much harder to get high order accuracy. Um, and we're not done, we're, not, we're, no, we're nowhere near done, but some of the things that we're planning to do are uh, taking the current solvers, which only do heat flow, and coupling them to reaction diffusion solvers, to advection diffusion solvers, and to full um, incompressible Navier-Stokes codes. And if you really wanna know what else we don't know how to do, the answer is there's a long list. Um, for many problems, we don't, believe that we necessarily have the optimal integral representations. There's, there's a mathematical task that needs to be done. We work a lot, I didn't have time to discuss it. Um, we work a lot on dealing with geometric descriptions of smooth objects and building high order accurate surface representations via, via um, local, local high order triangulation. We work a lot on uh, how to deal with corner and edge singularity effects and how to, how to maintain accuracy when those kinds of singularities are present. And we now work a lot um, not on the fast algorithms uh, for applying integral operators anymore. The, the big research area for us now is how to build direct solvers to invert them. So when you, right now, most of our solvers for large problems say we can do the matrix vector product, which is applying the integral operator fast, and then we iterate. But problems that are well, not well conditioned take many, many iterations. And so we are working very hard on trying to design direct solvers that also have, the, have optimal or nearly optimal asymptotic scaling. And uh, that's been a hard, that we've been, that's, that's a, been going on for, more than 10 years. Um, and there's been a lot of progress, but it's, it's still not a solved problem. And, um, but let me give you an idea of the kinds of calculations you can do for the elliptic case if you have fast direct solvers. So we pre-compute a kind of an inverse of the integral operator on the geometry. And then we, there's an incident field coming at different angles. And what you're seeing is the response. This is the, 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 the wave equation in, in the frequency domain at high frequency the response to an incoming wave at different angles of orientation. And the point is that it, you're seeing this in almost real time. The solver takes about one second to solve it for each orientation that you choose after an, a pre-computation that takes about an hour. So there's a big pre-computation phase, but then we can, we can solve problems that are very high frequency very well. Um, uh, uh, with Carlos Borges, who some of you may know, he was a student in, uh, from Rio. Um, he, he worked on inverse scattering, which I'm not gonna say very much about, but I have to show you one movie and then I'll stop. 
so the inverse scattering means the differential equation there at the top, which is Laplacian of u plus k squared times one minus q u equals right hand side. And inverse scattering means I don't know what q is. All I've been able to do is to have a wave hit an object and scatter, and I've measured the far field. So I've made measurements of the scattered field away from Q, and you're, the goal is to, is to find Q. And that's, that's called an inverse problem. And in this case, it's a very nonlinear inverse problem. It's a, it's a, it's a quadratic and, and with, K, with K large, a very, uh, a fully nonlinear, non-convex uh, problem that you're trying to solve. And let me just show you what happens. So we're trying to re reconstruct the, the picture on the right. And we started with the picture on the left. Let me, let, whoops, let me start that again. So we, we had no information about this. And, and we, we used a method which is called recursive linearization that was due to Yu Chen. Um, and we took all of the fast direct solvers that we had with, with Carlos and Adriana Gilman and were able in a fully nonlinear regime to resolve something to very high frequency entirely from far field measurements. And there are, I have to say, there are not very many calculations of inverse problems like that of such non-trivial uh, and, high, and high frequency objects. You typically see a few blobs and somebody said, yes, I think there's a few blobs here. This is a fully resolved thing at, at many features across. Um, okay, so that's the end. Uh, I, I hope this is a kind of an, at least an interesting tour through uh, many different kinds of problems. Um, right now, uh, I think it's fair to say that for certain classes of elliptic problems that, that are governed by electrostatics, uh, typically, where we're in very, we have a very good sense both of, of how to apply the operators and how to invert them very fast. For time harmonic problems like the, like the Maxwell equations in the frequency domain or the Helmholtz equation, things are good at low frequency and still getting hard at high frequency. But for fully time dependent problems like the heat equation, we have a, we have a kind of a parallel technology development, which is what I talked about in the second half of the talk. Um, that uh, has, has been making rapid progress in the last few years and due to many, many, many people. And I really do believe that we've now reached this point where there's enough technology available to actually start to think about that infrastructure of what scientific computing should look like. And that when that infrastructure is, is built, it will be much easier to create rapid prototyping um, on applications because you will have libraries of solvers that do very specific things and you will know which ingredients you need to solve the next application instead of having to start everything from scratch again, which is more or less what we do now. And um, this has been uh, joint work with many, many people, um, some of whom are here and some of whom are not, but at least the people who have been working with me in the last few years are all, are all up here and I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Professor Leslie. Uh, we have some questions. Sure. Uh, uh, someone uh, asked him the method he presents seems point-based. I cannot understand where grid, meshing, and cells enter the pictures. Um, say it again, that it looked point-based? Yeah, it, looked, it seems point-based. Ah, okay, I, I think I understand what they're asking. Whoops, went too far. Like here, so there's a mesh. Right, so, so, it, so here's the way we, the way we rep, the question is how do we represent U and how do we represent F on an adaptive data structure like that? And the answer is we, we take, so this is a, what's called an adaptive quad tree. That is, the whole box has been divided into four children. Each of those children is further subdivided and, and so on and so on and so on, except you don't have to do it. You don't divide everywhere. With a little bit of, the, 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 technically speaking, these are called level restricted so that no two boxes are more than one level apart in the refinement hierarchy. Okay, but on every box, the representation is F is expanded as a polynomial of a certain degree. 
So it's not exactly point-based. I, I, it's true that we wrote the integrals as if they're point-based, but the basis in which we expand everything is essentially a polynomial approximation for F and a polynomial approximation for U. And the way we decide whether U is resolved in this, in this movie that's doing adaptive refinement, in every box it says, at the current time, U is, how well resolved is U? And you can estimate how well that function is resolved if when you represent it as a polynomial, you represent it as a tensor product of Chebyshev or Legendre polynomials. And the reason that's important is that in that basis, in the basis of Legendre or Chebyshev polynomials, being resolved corresponds to rapid decay of the coefficients in the polynomial approximation. That's not true if you expand in monomials. And if you use the basis one x, x squared, x cubed, blah, 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 there's no correlation between smoothness and decay of coefficients. But if you approximate a function in, in the right basis, then decay of the coefficients in that polynomial representation is a hallmark of whether you're resolved. So what we do is we take a box and say, is it, does it look like it's resolved? And if it's not, we refine it. Okay, that would be enough to refine it. But you'll notice that when we run the movie, that it also coarsens. So what we also do is to say, okay, I have a child box. It thinks it's resolved. It then, it then takes the parent box, which has four children and says, does that parent, if I only represented it at the level of the parent, do I think it's resolved? That, does it, do I get the same answer as if it was resolved at the level of the children? And if that works, then we get rid of the children and go up to the parent. So the same notion, the same that, that spect what, what in mathematics would be called spectral decay of the coefficients, it's used both to decide when to refine and when to coarsen. But so we don't, ex we don't really use point-based values. What we use is piecewise polynomial approximation. Uh, okay, so the last question is, did you discover a new linear algebra while working on such higher, higher, hierarchical matrices, especially new elementary linear algebra? So did we learn new linear algebra? Is that, was that the question? Yes. Um, did you discover a new linear algebra? Well, it's hard. I mean, it, okay, that's a little hard. It's a little hard to answer that exactly. What I, what I would say is that if we go back to the beginning of this, which was, which I didn't discuss at all, but fa fast multiple methods, which are specifically designed to sum up gravitational interactions. So one over R sums over many things as a dense matrix. The fast multiple method was in some sense, the first systematic algorithm that tried to exploit rank structure in, uh, in doing linear algebra, full stop. And that, so there's been many, many developments since then that have, that have created a, in some sense, a field of linear algebra, which has many names depending on which country you're in. But I, I think of it all as, as uh, methods of linear algebra that concentrate on hierarchically compressible operators. So I don't know if that's considered a uh, new linear algebra, but the idea that there's a, there's a subclass of dense linear systems which have structure that can be exploited and to exploit that structure is a new, is a new uh, subfield, if you like, in linear algebra. And there's many, many people who work on that now from many different points of view. Um, all the way from numerical analysis to machine learning. And so, the, but, so, and, the, I, and that was not an idea that no one was really thinking about 30 years ago. No one was really thinking, if I have a dense matrix, does it have some other structure that I can exploit in some systematic way that's not as dense as you thought? There's, there's large blocks of it that are actually much more, we didn't, have, we didn't use the word compressible then, but, but now, now that's the word that's used. Are, are there matrices which have compressible Submatrices in them that can be exploited. So we didn't discover uh, any new fundamental fact about linear algebra. That was there are there have been very few fundamental facts about linear algebra in the last hundred years, um, but we've certainly uncovered areas where you can build new methods in linear algebra that exploit 
new ideas about the matrix structure. Yeah, um, those were all the questions we had. So okay. I think yeah. now is. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Leslie. It was an honor to have you here. Well, you're uh, very welcome. I'm glad I could do it. Um, uh, I want to thank you to all of you who watched the, our event today. We had over 2,000 views. Um, so this is the end of the third day of SEMAP. Uh -huh. We hope we, you all enjoyed today's program and looking forward for tomorrow when we start at 9.30 with Felipe Monteiro. And after him, it's Thiago Hart, the professor at UFRJ, and then Liz Custodio. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's, that's right. it for today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.